Are we going? Okay. All right, well, good evening, everyone. As always, thank you all for being here tonight. And before we got into it, we do want to announce that uh, Union Grove this Saturday, oh, East Side, East Side, yeah, East Side this Saturday, they're having a Ladies' Day, which begins at 9.30. And there were, uh, lunch will be provided, and uh, Sheila Butt will be doing the teaching in this session. And it begins at 9.30 and goes till noon, roughly something like that. So anyway, that's at East Side this coming uh, Saturday. And so if you get a chance to attend that, ladies, that would I'm sure that would be a wonderful learning opportunity. All right. Well, we are ready, I hope, to do to dig in beginning in Chapter 14. And we're going to see how far we can get tonight. And... Again, yeah, chapter 12 was very long last week, but these are, at least some of them are a little bit shorter, so hopefully we can get a little bit further this evening. So let's start out looking at the first nine verses in chapter 4. So we left off last week where finally you had the 10th plague. Pharaoh tells them to get out, and so the Israelites leave, and they take a bunch of goodies with them. They get treasure from Egypt. Uh, and they take it with them. They took the bones of Joseph with them. And so now we're going to pick up with their journey in the wilderness, which as we know is going to last for 40 years. They don't know that yet, but that's how long that's going to last. So in chapter 14, God instructs Moses as to where to camp for when they go out, the first place they're going to camp. And it seems to be uh, a trap. Okay, so it, it's not a place that any military general would, re oh yeah, let's, let's camp here. Because there's really no way out. Okay, which of course is what God has in mind. Because God's going to deliver them. Okay, and so where they're camping, you've got mountains on each side of them, and in front of them is the Red Sea. And behind them is Egypt. Okay, but this is where they're, they're going to camp. Okay, so mountains on each side, the Red Sea, uh, a part of the Red Sea that we believe is the Gulf of Suez is, is probably where they crossed. Again, we don't know 100% for sure, but that's a likely spot. And so, you know, God does this deliberately, of course, that way both the Israelites and the Egyptians are going to know that it was God that delivered them. There's no way to mistake that because they're in this what should be a really bad position. Okay, because God knows what's Pharaoh going to do. Micro. Yeah, he's going to change his mind. And it says the people, most of the Egyptians changed their mind too. They got to thinking about that. Go, what, what were we thinking? What we just let our slaves go. You know, they're hey, somebody get me a drink of water. What, I got to get up and get it myself? What was I thinking? Why did I let them go? So they all kind of changed their mind and say, well, that was a big mistake, letting our slaves. They were waiting on us and, and doing all of our hard work. Well, now we're going to have to do it. Well, that's no fun. And so Pharaoh decides to come after them, okay? which God, of course, knew uh, that he would do. So Pharaoh assembles his army of chariots and, and he catches up to the Israelites when they're in this camp where, again, the Red Sea's in front of them the mountains are to the left and to the right, and now they have the Egyptian army behind them. So they're seemingly trapped. Uh, and so Pharaoh probably thinks he's sitting in a really good position because he can now force them to return and come back and, and be their slaves again. Okay? So that's what we see in that first section. Then in verses 10 through 15, the Israelites notice the Egyptian army coming up behind them. So they see them. Now, what do you think their reaction is? Uh-oh. Yeah. They're terrified. Oh, no, that, that's not good. That can't be a good thing. And probably a lot of them realized, okay, we, we can't go that way, and we can't go that way, and we're going to get really wet if we go that way, and what are we going to do? So they probably felt trapped. And it says that they were really, they were horrified. They were scared. They were feared when they saw the Egyptian army. Now, should they have been? 
shouldn't have been. They should have had faith in God. Well, God's going to deliver us. He already got us out of there. He will take care of this. But they're not thinking that at this point. And so they start griping and they start complaining to Moses. And they tell Moses, what, why did you do this? You have led us out here to our death. You got us out of Egypt just to get us out here and kill us. So remember they griped at him before when they weren't freed fast enough and now they're complaining because they think it's, it's his fault that he's brought them out here to die. And they tell him something really interesting. You know, short-term memory. They tell him, tell Moses, that it would have been better if they had stayed in Egypt, if they had stayed in slavery. That would have been better. And they even claimed that they had never wanted to leave. <laughs> we, didn't we tell you, Moses, we didn't want to leave? We were happy slaves. It's, now, is that what they said at the time? No, they cried to God. They were begging for God to deliver them. Because remember, what, what was Pharaoh doing to them? Yeah, he's killing their firstborn. He's, he enslaves them with hard back-breaking labor. They're making bricks. And then if that wasn't bad enough, then he makes them go get their own straw. And so they're crying to God to save them. And now they're saying, you know, we never did want to leave. Well, we had it so good back there in Egypt. Short-term memory. It's like, boy, how quickly you forget how bad that was. But, but that's what they're saying. So they haven't come to the realization yet, apparently, that Patrick Henry came to in the revolutionary period. And if y'all remember your high school history class, if you don't, shame on you, but he gave a very famous speech, which it's a wonderful speech. If you ever get a chance to read the whole thing, all we hear is the last line. That's the only thing I was taught in school. But being the history nerd, now I've read the whole thing. It's a fantastic speech. But the last, what did he say? Give me liberty or give me death. He had realized, and the whole speech is about that. I would rather die fighting for my freedom than live under the oppression of the British government. So he had figured out it's better to die free than live as a slave. He said, I have no intention anymore. I've lived as figuratively speaking as a slave to the British. I'm not, I'm not willing to do that anymore. Well, they, they hadn't figured this out. So they, they're fondly remembering their slave days like, like that was a good thing. Crazy, crazy when you think about it. Now, you also realize that sometimes today, and that's why it's, you know, we've got to build these people up. Sometimes new Christians, you know, they're, they're converted and then they suddenly they're confronted with following God. I mean, when you're really trying to follow God, is that hard or is that easy? It's, it, there's a lot of hardness there. There's a lot of persecution there. There's a lot of self-sacrifice, right? We are to deny ourselves. Well, I can't live in sin like I used to. I can't do all those things that I thought was wonderful. So a lot of times new Christians, they, maybe they get that in their head too, that, man, this, this is really hard. Maybe I should just go back to that carefree life of sin, not realizing how bad that was, you know, because they, they think, well, serving God is, is so hard. So they don't realize that when they live in sin, they're really living in bondage. They're, they're in bondage to sin. They're in bondage to Satan. They don't, they don't seem to realize that sometimes. So that's kind of what we see here reminiscing fondly about, you know, it wasn't that bad being a slave. We just came out here to die. So Moses tells them, of course, in our modern vernacular, hey, boys, relax. Take a chill pill. God's got this. Okay, don't you, He's already delivered us. He will deliver us again. Don't you have any faith that God's going to take care of you? Right? Why would God, and if they just really thought about this, why would God do all those things to Egypt and then bring the Israelites out here only to kill them now? Does that make any sense? Of course it doesn't. You know, and they should have thought about that. Logically, that makes no sense whatsoever. Moses is like, don't you realize God's going to take care of you. But you've got to have faith in Him. You've got to trust Him that He's got this handled. 
So God tells Moses, they're going to love this, right? He tells Moses, so give the command, I want all the children of Israel to move forward to the Red Sea. Well, that sounds like a great plan. Actually, it is a great plan, but... So he commands them, move forward to go to the Red Sea. So then we see in verses 16 through 31 that Israel is delivered. So God tells Moses to raise his arms, raise his rod, and the Red Sea will be parted. Now, something else that's really interesting here that maybe sometimes some of us might overlook it, and I know for years I really just didn't think about it that much, but notice in verse 16 when he says that, lift up thy, but lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. The children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. So not only is the water parted, but so what they're walking across is a seabed. Well, what should it be? Like quicksand almost, right? I mean, it's been underwater for however long, right? But God even made the seabed instantly dry, which is another miracle. So He parts the Red Sea, but also He dries the seabed so they don't get bogged down in it. And again, the idea for God was that both the Israelites and the Egyptians are going to know that this is a miracle. There's no other way to explain this. That God has delivered them. They're going to know who the true God is. Unlike the Egyptian gods, who when the true God was doing everything to Egypt, what did the Egyptian gods do? Nothing, because they don't exist. Right? So they were powerless to do anything. So they're going to know this is the true God. And so we saw last time, we left off one of the last things we talked about, that God was a pillar of cloud in the day and a pillar of fire at night. And so the pillar of cloud went from being in front of the Israelites, so God was leading them. Now the cloud shifts and it goes behind them. Between the Israelites and the Egyptians. Protecting them. So the Egyptians can't overtake them. Okay, now, why would that be necessary? Yeah, how many are there again? Several million, right? So it's going to take them a long time to cross the Red Sea. And so this way God protects them so the Egyptians can't close in on them. It gives them time to get across. And something really interesting that we see in this passage is that Again, the pillar is now behind the Israelites and ahead of the Egyptians. But facing the Israelites is light. And toward the Egyptians, it's dark. So it's, we know from this several verses here, this crossing, it took place at night. Okay, So God is like a flashlight for the Israelites so they could see, but the Egyptians were in the dark behind. So yet another miracle. And we see in verse 24 where it talks about, um, and it came to pass that in the morning watch, that gives us an indication uh, of the time we're talking about. So the morning watch, so remember the firstborn, that was at midnight. The morning watch is sometime between 2 a.m. and daybreak. So this is when they would have crossed the Red Sea. So, But it's still dark when they're doing it. And so you would think, you would hope that when the Israelites saw this, these walls of water, and Bob said maybe they saw some fish in there too, right? you would think it would strengthen their faith. Because it would take a lot of faith for you to walk through there. Thinking, boy, if that wall of water crashes down, I'm dead. But they did go through there, so their faith must have been strengthened. And it should have been seeing something like this. This is not something you see every day. Now, something interesting I want to point out that some people today, they will use this account 
they will say, well, see, this shows us that salvation is by faith only. All you got to do is believe and God will save you. And they'll use this episode, this, this event, to argue for that. The, the idea that, well, see, God did everything for them. So God parted the Red Sea. God gave them light. He made the Egyptians in the dark. He was between the Egyptians. They couldn't catch it. So God did everything for them. So there you go. It's We don't really need to do anything. God will do everything for our salvation. Okay? Now, what's wrong with that argument? To use this to try to prove that. Did God do everything for them? What Did they have to do something? They had to cross it. Right? So it wouldn't have done any good for them to stand on the shore and God parts the Red Sea and for them to say, okay, God will pick us up and take us over there. But He didn't. They had to walk across the sea. So yes, they had something to do. God did not do everything for them, but God opened the pathway for them. They had to take the path. Okay? Often compare it to, it's like a, a door. Right? So God will open doors for us. What do I have to do? I have to walk through. God's not going to shove me. He's not going to grab me by the neck and say, go boy. He's not going to shove me through it. I have to walk through the door. So God will provide me with opportunities, but I have to recognize and I have to act on the opportunity. So God is not going to do everything for us. Our faith has to be an active faith. We have to obey God's commands and do what He tells us to do. But you will hear that argument. Well, this proves that We don't have to do anything. Well, they're negating the fact they had to walk across there. They had to physically walk across there. God didn't magically float them across. He could have if He wanted to, but He didn't. So He did a lot for them, but they had something they had to do as well, and and just like we do uh, today. Now, as we said, the pillars behind them when they're, they're walking across, and so the Egyptians... As I guess as the end of the Israelites went, the pillar moved with them. God moved with them. And so the Egyptians followed when they could as, as the pillar moved. And you would think that you know if I were an Egyptian then and I witnessed this, I mean, wouldn't you, if, if it happened to you, wouldn't you be impressed by this? I mean, you would think, right? You you would have to go, there's no other way to explain this. Their God is the God. None of the Egyptian gods, I've never seen them do anything like this. Pharaoh's magicians couldn't do anything like this. You would think that that would impress them. But apparently not. At least not enough to, to believe and do what they should have done. And you also would have think it would have scared them. That Pharaoh would have thought, I'm not going in there. That's crazy. But they went. So they followed as they could. Uh, And maybe maybe the darkness confused them a little bit. I don't know. Then we see that God causes the Egyptians. What happens to their chariots? The wheels come off. All the wheels come off of all the chariots. Okay, well that's odd. (laughs) Right? So it's at this point that the Egyptians begin to realize, hey, you know what? Uh, Maybe God is on their side and maybe we should get out of here. Too late. Because they're all in there now. All of them. Every one of them. But now they start getting scared and think, man, we got to retreat. we got to turn around and we got to go back. At this point, God tells Moses to do what? Stretch forth your hand and the rod again and the water will come crashing down while all the Egyptians are in there. Okay. Now, verse 27 tells us that this occurred around daybreak when the water is going to come crashing down on the Egyptians. So it's, it's starting to get daylight at this point. And it says all of the Egyptians were drowned and the Israelites standing on the other shore what do they see? They see the bodies of the Egyptians wash up on the shore. So 
So at this point, now the Israelites do have a firm faith in God, a respect for Him. Now they're patting Moses on the back. And, and you again, you would think after seeing this, how God delivered them, you would think that their faith would be permanent. You would think, but you'd be wrong. Because <laughs> it's not going to be permanent. In fact, it's not going to last very long at all. It's not going to be long before they start griping and they start complaining and they start whining to Moses and they want to go back to Egypt even after everything they just saw. All right, so that brings us to chapter 15. And in this chapter, we have something that's known as the Song of Moses. It's even referred to in the book of Revelation, the Song of Moses. And so basically what you see in this chapter is Moses leads them in a celebration of their deliverance from Egypt. So they're, they're celebrating what God has done for us. And so in this chapter, as you go through it, the song just it basically recounts the story of how they're delivered. It's full of praises to God. In fact, and they give God full credit for what just happened, as they should have. So just a couple of quick highlights that they mention, they talk about God being my Father's God. Who do you think they're talking about? God is my Father's God. Who's that? Abraham, yeah. So they're talking about Father Abraham. Uh, they talk about God being a warrior and His enemies cannot defeat Him. And, that, and that's true. But some scholars believe that may have been where the false notion comes from when you get to Christ, you get to the first century. Uh, the Jews' concept of the Messiah was what? A warrior like that, like he's going to defeat the at this point the as unknown future enemy, but that would be the Romans. So a lot of people feel like this may have been where they got this concept that yeah, when the Messiah comes, he's going to just like God defeated the Egyptians. If Christ were really the Messiah, he would take down the Romans, which of course that wasn't what Christ came for at all. And that was never what the Messiah was for. But maybe this is where that false notion came from. But at least here again, they're acknowledging God is great. And he gets all the credit. They acknowledge that all the Egyptian gods were false. They are looking forward to the land of Canaan. They believe that God will deliver them to it because He said He would. And of course He will. Of course, now these people here, are they going to see it? Nope, because they're going to disobey God. But they're confident at this point that God will take them there. They're confident that the people that are living there, collectively known as the Canaanites, they will be defeated. God will deliver Canaan to them, which He will. But at this point, they're very confident of that and they're celebrating that. And they're excited that you know they've always been kind of wanderers, but now God is going to give them a home of their own. They're going to have their own homeland. Now, in verse 20, we see something interesting that again leads people today, oh, well, that, this means this. Verse 20, And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, which of course also Moses' sister, took a timbrel in her hand and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. Okay, so they use this verse. She's called for one thing a prophetess, which probably meant she instructed the women like Moses and Aaron instructed the men. Uh, but they focus on, well, she, she danced with a tambourine, some kind of tambourine-like instrument. So people will say, well, aha, there it is. That shows that we can use instruments and we can dance in the modern worship service because Miriam did it. So we can dance and we can play music and we can hop the pews and you know all this kind of stuff. 
because that's what she was doing. So they'll use this verse to do that. Well, are there any problems with that? Yeah, I can think of several myself. First of all, there's no mention of anything like this anywhere in the New Testament. No mention of anybody dancing in church or anybody playing a musical instrument. I think God would have brought that up if that was something He wanted us to do, but there's zero mention of it in the New Testament. So that, that's one problem you have. Another problem that you think about is remember what this was. Was this a worship service? No, it was a celebration. It was, there, that's a different thing than a worship service. So just because she did it in celebrating, that doesn't mean you're allowed to do it when you're worshiping God. Because as we're going to see, God has very specific instructions about how He wants worship done. And dancing and playing tambourines is not part of it. So apparently God allowed her to do that on this occasion. There's no record of her being punished or, or God being upset about it. But you also have to realize that f throughout most of history, and it, it's still really that way, dancing was usually associated with what? Joyous occasions. Joyous occasions. Was it associated with good things a lot of the time or bad things? Like behavior. Well, it can be in this case. But often, again, especially as you read through the Scriptures, just about every time that those things are mentioned, they go very closely fit with idolatry. And think about when we get to the golden calf. They're going to be dancing around. and So almost every time that is mentioned, it goes with idolatry. It goes with immoral behavior. It was associated often with drunkenness. It was associated with immoral sexual behavior. It wouldn't always have to be necessarily, but it typically is because that's the way people act. Just think about the prom today. What activities often go along with the prom? And statistics bear this out. What kind of behavior? A lot of drunkenness, a lot of alcohol at the prom, a lot of sexual immorality at the prom. Statistics bear that out. Does that, just because you go to the prom, you got to do that? No, but what I'm saying is a lot of people do. It, they seem to go hand in hand. So that's something else to consider as well. But the main things, again, this is not a worship service and nowhere will you find it mentioned in the New Testament. But for people that they want to do that, they try to latch on to anything. Oh, well, Miriam did it, so you know. So you'll come across that and just kind of be aware. All right, then verses 22 through 27. The end of the chapter, they travel on through the desert, through the wilderness, and they're low on water, as you would expect. So they come to this place known as Marah, and they found there's water there, but it's not drinkable. And so what do you think they do? They start griping to Moses. Same old story, right? You brought us out here to die. We should have stayed in Egypt. So, And this is only three days after the Song of Moses. So the three days earlier, they're celebrating and praising God, and then three days later, they're... Why'd you bring us out here? We're, we're gonna, God's going to let us die. So it didn't take long. So Mo, Moses calls on God. He's given a tree and he tells Moses, throw the tree in the water. The water will be drinkable. So again, yet another miracle. Suddenly the water is drinkable. Why? Because Moses obeyed that command. He did what God told him to do. So in a way here, God lets them get thirsty because He's testing them. He wants them to know that they need to rely on Him. He's not going to let them die. He's going to take care of them. And they, they just can't seem to always get that through their head. And God is just saying, look, if you'll just be faithful to me, I will take care of you. He also says here, I'll protect you from all the Egyptian diseases. Everything you're familiar with, I'll protect you from those things. If you will just Obey me. 
So then they go another seven miles to a place called Elam, and there the water was abundant. They had plenty of water, and so that's where they camp. The idea again, God provides. He's always going to provide. All right, chapter 16. So now they're at a place that's got better water, but again, they, they start complaining. They complain to Moses and Aaron. They complain about Moses and Aaron. This, this, at this point, it's about 30 days or about a month after they've left Egypt. We well, said they had plenty of water. They do. But now they're hungry. They don't have enough food. Remember, they didn't take much food with them because they didn't have time. So now they're hungry. So once again, I think God lets them get hungry because He wants them to realize He will provide for them. I know, you know, God's looking down. I know you don't have enough food. You think I don't know that? I'm going to provide for you. Have faith. But they are—they're griping and they're complaining. And again, same story. We'd have been better off if we stayed back in Egypt and if we were still slaves. Because hey, at least there we had food. You brought us out here to starve to death. At least we had food. Again, forgetting about the hard labor and searching for the straw and making the bricks and you couldn't meet the quota so you're going to get beaten. Yeah, they just forgot all that. Forgot all those hardships. Hey, at least we had food. Well, yeah, you did have food. And the thing is, what about out here? Are they going to have food? Yeah. They'll just believe in God. Yes, they're going to have food here without the slavery. To me, that's a win. So, verses 4 through 8, God promises to provide them with food. So, what's He going to send them? Yeah, manna from heaven, bread from heaven. So, God says, Look, I'm going to send you manna from heaven. You will have plenty to eat. Nobody's going to go hungry. Several million people and everybody is going to have plenty to eat. Okay. Now, this of course is physical food. But if we compare this to Christ, what is Christ to us? The bread of life, right? Spiritual food. Yeah. And so when you talk about the manna and Christ, there are, again, this is like a type and a type, there are similarities. They foreshadowing. The manna was for physical needs. Christ will be for spiritual needs. But when we think, what do they both have in common? Well, number one, both came from heaven. The manna comes from heaven. Christ came down from heaven. Secondly, as we just said, they both bring life. Thirdly, they both represented at the time Jesus for all time, but the man of then, that was the only hope that was available. And then fourth, it was meant for all. God said, I'm going to feed all of you. Everybody will have plenty of manna. Who did Jesus die for? Everybody. Everybody won't take advantage of that. That's a sad fact, but that doesn't mean Jesus didn't shed His blood for every single person. He gave everybody the opportunity. Okay? So when you compare the manna and Christ, this is really what they have in common. So again, the manna foreshadows what Christ is going to do. What manna did physically, Christ will do spiritually. Okay? So again, God wants them just to trust Him that He will provide just relax. He will provide for them. And He's going to give them, for a future reference, He's now going to give them very specific instructions, but they're really simple instructions about how this is going to work going forward through the wilderness. Because obviously where they're going, there's not a lot of places to generate a lot of food. But they won't need to do that because God's going to give it to them. So, he tells them, he said, what I want you to do is you're going to gather. Every day I'm going to rain down manna from heaven and you are going to gather daily. So every morning you're going to go out 
and you're going to get this manna, this bread. It'll, it'll be laying on the ground. And so he said, so we're going to do that days one through five. You will have an, I'm going to send you enough manna for that day. On day six, God said, I'm going to send you two days worth. Because on day seven, you are not to go look for any manna because there won't be any. Now, now what's he kind of preparing them for? The Sabbath, which they haven't had that yet, but they're about to, right? So yeah, on day seven, there's to be no work. You're not doing any of this thing. So on day six, I will give you double the portion. So you'll have enough for day six and day seven of the week. And then on the first day of the week, again, you can go back to picking it in the morning. And so he's, he's preparing them for the Sabbath. So Moses, then he goes and tells everybody. says, look, here's the deal. Tonight, this evening, God will provide meat for you to eat. And then starting tomorrow, we're going to have this bread come down from heaven. Okay, But I know you're hungry now. God's going to prov provide you with meat. Now what's He going to give them? Does anybody remember? Quail. quail. Yeah, quail. Did He give them enough? Yep, everybody had plenty to eat. Okay. So Moses tells them, tonight you're going to have quail. And Moses trying to make them understand again that, look, I'm not saving you. Aaron's not saving you. This all comes from God. You need to depend on God. Okay, because here's a key point. And for us today too, obviously. Moses tells them, said, look, when you gripe at me or you gripe at Aaron, you're not really griping about us. Because Moses tells them, says, we, Aaron and I, we are nothing. So what are they really doing? They're in, so, yeah, they're griping about God is what they're doing. So when you insult me, you're insulting God. I'm, I'm just a humble servant of God. I'm nothing. So if you're mad at me, you're really upset with what God is doing or what you think He's failing to do. You are criticizing God. And now one reference we could look at, 1 Samuel 8, 6, and 7, we see this is when the people, they want a king. Right? In 1 Samuel 8, 6, and 7. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. So Samuel here says he's very dejected about this. And God said, Samuel, they're not going against you. They're going against me. And then in Luke 10, 16, again, Jesus said the same thing. Right? He that heareth you, heareth me. And he that despiseth you, despiseth me. And he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. Okay. This is an important lesson for us to learn because Christians today, and there are some that do it, hopefully none of us in this room, hopefully, but there are some that do it. People that in the church, they will gripe and they will complain about the preacher or about the elders or about the deacons or what we've got to understand that assuming those people are faithful, that we have a legitimate gripe if they're doing something they shouldn't be doing, we have a preacher that wants to bring a piano in here. Okay, well then, yeah, we need to say something. But if the elders are faithful, if the deacons are faithful, if the preacher is faithful, if they are doing what the Bible says, and we complain about them, what are we doing? Complaining We're complaining against God. We're, you're not complaining against the preacher. right? If I'm preaching the Gospel, and I'm telling you what the Bible says, and you don't like what I'm telling you, what you're really saying is you don't like what God says. Assuming I'm not making, I'm not going off on some tangent, making up something, right? But if I'm telling you what's in this book and you don't like it, 
you're telling God you don't like what He said. And so we need to remember that. So that's Moses trying to get them to understand that. Oh, you're, you're not griping at me and Aaron. You're griping at God. And that needs to stop. God is perfect. God doesn't make mistakes. We have no room to complain. God will provide everything that you need. So then in verses 9 through 15, we see that God does provide them with enough quail that night. So everybody's got enough food. And then in the morning, when the dew evaporated, guess what they saw on the ground? Dust. No, what did they see? Manna, bread. They didn't even know what it was. Moses had to explain it to them. What is that stuff? That's the bread that God put. You eat that. Oh. Remember I told you yesterday, God would... There it is. That's what it is. They didn't even know. They didn't understand what it was. Do what? It might. I didn't look that up. I don't know. Does it? Yeah. That would make sense. Yeah. What? Because it says here that they did not know what it was until Moses explained it to them. So then verses 16 through 21, God tells them, God tells Moses, He tells them how much they were together. So it's all over the ground and everybody was told to gather. Okay, that was weird. An, an omer, omer, I'm not sure how you pronounce that word. But that comes out to about one and a half to two quarts, roughly in our measurement. And so Moses tells them, you gather that per person in your tent, your family. So if there's five people, you gather enough. This is per person. So for simple math, two quarts, so you would get ten quarts because you've got five people in your family. So you gather this amount per person for every person in your tent. And that was the perfect amount for everybody to eat. Nobody's going to go hungry. And they were also told to do it quickly. So when you get up in the morning, you need to get out and you need to gather this because what would happen, the sun would melt it. So God wants them to do it when He tells them to do it. You get up first thing in the morning, go out and gather the manna, the food that you'll need for the day. Okay. Now, God also told them, you're not to save any. So again, don't get four quarts. And you know some of them will. right? Well, I'm, I'm going to hoard some. I'm going to get some extra. And God told He was adamantly said, don't do you get exactly what I tell you to get. You don't need to get extra for the next day. Why not? Do what? Well, He's going to do that. But I mean, why don't you need to save up some? Yeah, it, it's coming tomorrow too. Right? Why? Because God said so. Right? So if I bring it to you on Monday, I'm going to bring it to you on Tuesday. And I'm going to bring it to you on Wednesday. You don't need to save any extra. That demonstrated what? A lack of faith. Right? Yeah. A lack of faith. Well, I'm not sure that God will bring me some tomorrow, so I better get all I can. No, you need to have faith that God will do what He said He will do. So you gather this amount today, and tomorrow and the next day you can do the same thing. And so like Bob just said, what God did, if they did gather extra, because some of them will do that, what happened to it? Yeah, God caused worms in it and it smelled awful the excess that they had gathered so it's not going to last till tomorrow anyway because you're trying to circumvent what I told you to do so that extra that you gathered yeah it's going to get worms in it it's going to stink it's not going to be edible but again the key idea there is that it showed their lack of faith that they didn't trust that God would do what he said he would do I'm going to bring you manna every day and twice on the sixth day, so that on the seventh day, you don't need to pick any because you'll have enough. All right, so then we get to verses 22 through 31, and here we see the Sabbath day established. So, as we said, they were provided with and were told to gather twice as much on day six. 
so they would have extra on day seven. Well, wait a minute, I thought you just said the extra turned to worms and it smelled really bad. Guess what happened to the extra they picked on day six? Yeah, it didn't do that. But only on day six. They gathered extra on day three. Whoo! I wouldn't eat that if I were you. But on day six, the extra stayed perfectly fresh just like the day five. Okay. And so God told them, He said, I don't even want you to go out on day seven and even look for manna. You're not going to find it. It's not going to be there. But don't even go look for it. And guess what happened? Some people went to look for it. And God was not a happy camper about that. Because they just, again, they failed to obey His very simple, specific command. Well, I'm going to go out and look for manna. What did I just tell you not to do? How many of us parents ever had that? My mom did with me too. What did I just tell you not to do? What I just did? Yeah. So yeah, it's like a parent to a little child, you know. Didn't I just tell you not to stick your hand in the cookie jar? Oh, I didn't. I thought you were kidding. I didn't know you really meant that. So very simple, specific commands, and yet some of them didn't obey it. So then something else, God tells Moses to tell Aaron. So Moses tells Aaron to gather up an omer of manna, put it in a pot, some kind of vessel, and we're going to save this so it's not going to decompose or it's not going to get worms or we're going to save this. What do, you, what do you think God wants Him to save one portion for? It's not to feed people. What? They are going to put it in the ark. Why? To remember it, right? We want future generations who... Because the manna, as we're going to see, it will be provided the whole 40 years. What happens when they get to Canaan? It'll stop because they don't need it. Right? So there will come a day where God knows there'll be people alive who've never seen manna. I've never seen it. You've never seen it. There'll be people who won't see it, but see, I want this preserved so that they can see it. Because after the wilderness wanderings, manna will never appear again. Okay. And so then we see, as, as J.W. just said in Hebrews 9 and 4, what did they do with it? Well, Hebrews 9 and 4 says, talking about the ark, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein, in other words, inside, was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. That's what's inside the ark. What are the tables of the covenant? The Ten Commandments, right. So that's what was in the ark. Aaron's rod, the Ten Commandments, and this pot with manna. What was inside the ark. Okay. So as we said, God provided this manna six days a week for 40 years. Every day because other food wasn't available. Now that should have proven to them that God was going to sustain them. But as we said, the manna would cease when they got to Canaan. Uh, anybody remember, what did God call the land of Canaan besides the promised land? How do you describe it? Land of milk and honey. The land of milk and honey. What does that mean? The land of plenty, right? There'll be plenty of food and water there. So they won't need manna anymore. So God's giving them a land where they can sustain themselves. So you won't need it. So it will stop when they get to Canaan, but they're going to have it up till that point. All right, chapter 17. So first they were upset because there wasn't enough water. God provided that. Then they got plenty of water. Now there's no food and they're upset about that. God provided that. Well, now we come full circle again. Now they're low on water and they're very upset that they don't have enough water to drink. 
Same thing. They accuse Moses of bringing him there to die. I'm sure Moses said, yeah, that was my plan all along. Yeah, I just want to bring you all millions of people out here so I could kill you. Or, or yeah, God just wants to kill you. Well, he could have killed you in Israel if he'd wanted to kill you. But they that's what they say and they gripe about it. And, and so Moses goes to God and he's really concerned. He He's so concerned about this. He's, he tells God, he says, I think they're going to stone me to death. I think they're going to kill me. They're so mad at me about this. But Moses does chastise the people again saying, well, you're not really mad at me. You're mad at God. You're criticizing God. Hasn't God always provided? When you needed water, did He give it to you? Yes. When you needed food, did He give it to you? Yes. Now you need water again. Do you think He's going to give it to you? The answer should be yes. He's going to provide. But they, they're they still letting fear weaken and damage their faith. And so, again, a valuable lesson for us is that you know they had gotten their freedom from the Egyptians. Well, freedom does have a price. It's not always easy. Talked about Patrick Henry a while ago, right? We had to fight a, a revolutionary war to get our separation from England. It wasn't easy. Nothing worth having usually is. So we need to remember us today too, God's not going to keep every single hardship away from us. And some people seem to have that, oh, if I, once I'm baptized, I'll never have a problem again. I'll never have any disease. I'll be rich. God's going to give me everything I need. That's No, God never promised that. What did He promise? What did Jesus promise? If you follow me, everything's going to be great. Is that what He said? Yeah, you're going to have trials and tribulations. Take up your what? Take up your cross and follow me. You're going to have problems. You're going to be persecuted for my name's sake. So he never said, oh yeah, you're going to be on easy street if you become a Christian. So we got to understand that, yeah, God's not going to solve all of our problems. But God will give us the hope, the opportunities, the tools we need to get through whatever these trials and tribulations are, but we're still going to have them. We've got to understand that. So God here, He's long-suffering toward them as He is for us, and we're thankful for that. And So He provides them with the water. And this is at least the first of two times we're seeing specifically about this, where God tells Moses there's a, a rock there, and He tells Moses to do what? Strike the rock. If you strike the rock, water will come out. And so Moses does, and the water does come out. Later on, what's going to happen? Yeah, the second time God's going to tell Moses to speak to the rock, what does he do? He strikes it instead. And for that reason, Moses will not be allowed to enter Canaan. So that's, that's much later down the road. But here's the first time we see that reference, strike the rock, and so he does and they get the water. All right, then the other big thing we see in this chapter is the battle with Amalek. So we see that the Amalekites, they're going to attack the, the stragglers in the back of the column. Now, Exodus doesn't tell us, tell us that specifically, but Deuteronomy 25 does. It says they're, they're hitting at the rear, kind of getting the stragglers that are in the back. Okay, uh, Deuteronomy 25, uh, verses 17 and 18, we see that. So we don't, we don't get that detail here in Exodus, but we do get it in Deuteronomy. That that's who they were going after. And these are, who are the Amalekites? Well, they're the descendants of Esau. Okay, And so in order to fight against them. Oh, I had that. I didn't realize I had that up there. In order to fight against them, Moses sends a particular man to lead the, the Israelite men in battle. And to the best of my knowledge, this is the first time we see this man's name in the Bible. And his name is Joshua. 
Now, what's significant about Joshua? Yeah, he will succeed Moses as the leader when Moses is not allowed to enter Canaan. Joshua will lead them into Canaan. Okay, so this is, to my knowledge, is the first reference we ever see to Joshua. So Moses puts him in charge and says, I want you to lead the men and go fight this battle. So he does. So Moses goes to a hill. This is kind of depicted in this painting here. So Moses goes to a hill that overlooks the battle. And when Moses raises his rod, the Israelites win. And when his arms get tired and he lowers the rod, they start losing. So Aaron, we know, and then another man by the name of Hur, which we see a few times. We don't really know a lot about Hur. He must have been some position of prominence, but we're really not told hardly anything about him. But Aaron and Hur go there like you see here and they hold Moses' arms up because the battle lasted all day. And so they hold his arms up and the Israelites win the battle. And then God tells Moses to record this. He says, I want you to record all this in a book. So that's probably the Pentateuch. And God also gives a hint of future events here. He tells Moses that you know, there will come a day where I will utterly destroy the Amalekites. It's not going to be today, but it will happen. And does anybody know when is that fulfilled? When, when was that fulfilled? Does anybody know? Because they will be. Well, mostly. Because somebody's not going to follow God totally. But when will the Amalekites be destroyed? Well, we see that in 1 Samuel chapter 15 when King Saul. But remember, he didn't follow all the commands, right? God said, I want you to wipe them out. He saved the king and he saved the best animals and God was not pleased. But that's going to be about 400 years after this. So that's kind of a prophecy in a way that God's talking about. All right, chapter 18. Okay, now in this chapter we see that, remember Moses in that middle 40 years of his life, he's a shepherd out in the desert, and he had a father-in-law by the name of Jethro. Y'all remember us talking about him? So Jethro comes to visit out here in the wilderness. And he brings his own daughter, which is Moses' wife. He brings Moses' two sons. It's, it's a nice family reunion. And he had heard about, Jethro had heard about what happened. Egypt and the Red Sea and all that stuff. And, and so he states that, yeah, your God is the true God. He's greater than, than all other gods. And so it tells us that Jethro worships God with Moses. Apparently that was not something he'd done in the past, but he does now. Okay. And so mainly that's the first 12 verses just kind of talks about that. And so the main thing that happens in this chapter in 37 or 13 through 27 was what we see is, uh, and that's kind of what's depicted here in the, in the painting, any kind of issue, any problem the Israelites had while they're in camp, well, they all had to go to Moses. And Moses was the judge, and he would decide. Okay, so if there was a dispute between Sid and, and JW, then they would take it before Moses, and Moses would decide who was right, who was wrong, what should be done, that kind of thing. Okay, well, what was brought before Moses? Well, everything that anybody had a complaint about. Some may be legitimate, some may be not legitimate. Every problem had to go to Moses. And Moses would judge according to God's commands what he was supposed to do. Now, how many people again are we talking about? Two yeah, two, three, four million. Now, they're not all going to be, but probably every day that this went on, there was probably several thousand people standing in line, probably all day in the heat, getting mad. <laughs> Moses getting frustrated because he sees this line, you know, and going, Man, I've got to deal with all this. 
I've got to hear everybody's gripe and everybody's complaint. And I got to deliver righteous judgment. You know, so it must have been a huge strain on him. And the people, again, think about us today. If I'm in the drive through more than two or three minutes, I get a little, where's my burger? Let's go. Thought this was fast food, man. Let's go. Right? So you can imagine. Yeah, I'm going to stand in this line for the next five hours and it's 97 degrees out here and i got to wait to, you know. So Jethro has a really good idea. He tells Moses, look, man, this is crazy. You're, you're having to do all this. You need some help. This is too much for one man to handle. So he suggests, he said, look, you're going to wear yourself out if you keep doing this. Why don't you teach and appoint some other men to help you judge? They can judge the little stuff and anything that's really truly significant, well, it can still be brought to you. But, but they can deal with a lot of the more insignificant things that you don't need to deal with. Why, why don't you do that? It'll reduce your workload. The lines will be shorter. It'll be better for everybody. And he said, you could put different men over different numbers of people and, and that sort of thing. So he told Moses they ought to have certain qualifications. And so here's what he told Moses, this kind of men you ought to pick. Number one, they should be able men. In other words, you know, they're intelligent, they've got wisdom. You need to pick men, this one should be obvious, men that fear God. All right? They want to do the right thing. You should pick men of truth. In other words, they're interested in true justice. They're not going to be biased in some way. They, they want to do what's right. And then this one's really important too. Men that are not covetous. But what's that got to do with it? Yeah, they, these are men that can't be bribed. Hey, you know, I'm going to bring my case to you. If you'll rule my way, here's a hundred for it. You know, right? Men that will not take a bribe. They're going to, and, and that goes again with their men of truth. They fear God. They want to do the right thing. So they're not going to make a wrong judgment because you pay them to do it. So Jethro said, yeah, these are the guys you ought to get to help you. Okay, and so they can deal with the lesser matters and you just focus on the, the really, there will be some significant big stuff. That's what you need to handle. Okay? And that does, of course, that, that sounds like a, a good idea. And we see this in the Scriptures, even for us today. Galatians 6 and 2, bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, right? It's too much for one person to deal with. So in a congregation, that's why we need, God desires elders and deacons and preachers. Share the load. It's too much for, if we put everything on the preacher, or everything on the elder. It's just too much. So spread the workload. And is it just the elders, deacons, and preachers? Or does everybody in the congregation have a responsibility? Everybody's to be abounding in the work of the Lord, right? So we help each other and one man doesn't get burned out, overburdened, you know, overly stressed. It's just too much for one person. So now, last thing, we'll close with this. I was hoping we'd get 19 done. We almost got there. Um, in verse 23, Jethro tells Moses, yes, yeah, my idea, and I want you to do this, but you should only do this if what? If who approves of it? If God does. You need to check with God. I think this is a great idea, but you need to run it past God, which apparently Moses does, and it was approved, and so Moses is allowed to do this. He's allowed to delegate authority. But the important point is Jethro knew it's got to be approved by God. We can't do anything without God saying, yeah, this is, this is acceptable, this is fine. Are y'all willing to give me 10 more minutes? Because I think I can do chapter 19 in 10 more minutes and we'll, we'll almost be caught up. That'll get us ready for the Ten Commandments. Okay, I'll, I'll go through it quick. Okay, in chapter 19, 
in verses 1 through 6, we see this is when they arrive at Mount Sinai. And it tells us this is the third month after they've left Egypt. Okay, So sometime during the third month, they get there. And apparently, if you look at Numbers 1 and 1, they're going to be there for you know close to two years or, or thereabouts. Now, where is Mount Sinai? Yeah, do we know exactly which mountain it is? We do not. Unless somebody just discovered something last night that I don't know about. But there are tourist places over there. If you ever go there, they'll gladly take your money and they'll take you to Mount Sinai. They don't have a clue. Okay, We know that Mount Sinai is in the Horeb mountain chain. So it's one of those mountains. But we really don't know exactly which one it was. And it doesn't matter. But it was one of these mountains in this chain that was referred to as Sinai, but it is on the Sinai Peninsula, right? Like Lauren said. And so this is where Moses, of course, is going to go up. He's going to, God's going to talk to him. And so God tells Moses, I want you to remind the people that God is the one who delivered them. God is the one that brought them to this place. They need to remember that. And he told them the same thing that he tells us. Which is, you will be my people if... What? You will be a child of God if you keep my commandments. You obey what I tell you to do. You will be my child. So it's the same thing for us as it was for them. So God tells Moses to remind the people of that. As long as they obey me, they will be my people and I will take care of them. And when they disobey, that's going to be a problem. Okay, so this, of course, is where they're about to be given the detailed laws that we see going forth from this point. And then we're going to see more in Leviticus. So Israel, God said, Israel is to be a holy nation. Just like the church today Galatians 6.16, we are to be a spiritual Israel. What we're supposed to be. So Israel was to be a holy nation. Galatians 6.16. Uh, 6, uh, also 1 Peter 2.9 I think says has a similar idea. But yeah, Israel was to be a holy nation. The church today is to be a spiritual Israel. So verses 7 through 15, then Moses tells this to, he goes and tells the people what God said. And they promise they're going to obey God. And so then God tells Moses that he will appear to the people in three days. He will be in a thick cloud. Again, nobody's ever seen the face of God. You can't look at God, but. He will appear before them in this thick cloud in three days. And so he tells Moses to tell them to get ready. And they must sanctify themselves before God comes down. So how do they do that? Well, they did this by washing themselves very carefully, washing their clothes very carefully. They were going to be in the presence of God, and so they had to be at their best. Now, is there a lesson in there for us? Should we always give God our best? <coughs> right? So they they were, as we would say, dressing up. You're, you're getting ready to be before the creator of the universe. Shouldn't you put a little effort into it? And yet we see people all the time come to church like they're headed for the bowling alley or, you know, it's like, this is God. Shouldn't we give our best? Shouldn't we look our best? Shouldn't we take this seriously and have the appropriate reverence for God? And yet a lot of people don't. So God told Moses, you tell them they better get ready. 
It is not acceptable for them just in their everyday stuff. They've got to purify themselves. He also said that married couples were not to have physical relations during this time because he wants them focused on spiritual matters, not carnal things. And he says, you're going to hear a trumpet. And when you hear that trumpet, you approach the mountain, Mount Sinai. Approach it. But don't touch it. No people no animals. Do not lay a finger on the mountain itself, but just come to the base of the mountain and go no further. Now, what do you think would happen if anybody touched it? Death. Yeah, the penalty was death. God told Moses, I will kill anyone, man or animal, that touches the mountain while he's on it. That's, you know, that's holy ground. So Moses is going to be allowed to go up. But all the people said, I want them close to the mountain, but don't touch it. Okay, so then verses 16 through 25, God does in fact come on the third day like you said He would. It tells us there was smoke, there was fire, thunder, lightning. The mountain itself quaked. I mean, you could just, it's kind of hard to imagine what this must have been like. They did hear a loud trumpet, just like God said there would be. And it says that the Israelites, they trembled before the presence of God, which is, that's what they should have done. And something else interesting at this point, it says they actually heard the voice of God speaking to Moses. And it, it terrified them. So at that point, God calls Moses to come up. Nobody else. Moses can come up. And so Moses gets up there, and then God tells him, okay, now I want you to go right back down, and I want you to remind the people not to touch the mountain. I want you to go down and do that. He said, tell the people and tell the priests. Now, the Levitical priesthood hadn't been established yet. So that was probably just the heads of families he's probably talking about. So I want you to go down and tell them nobody's to touch the mountain. You tell them that they will be killed if they touch the mountain. If they try to look at God. Because he says, you know, God is holy, man is not holy. So they're not worthy to look upon him. So if anybody tries to sneak a peek, they'll be killed. Now, the interesting thing is, as you can imagine, so God's already told Moses that, and Moses already told everybody. So then he goes up there, and God says, okay, I want you to go right back down and tell them. So probably what most of us might have done, Moses does. He said, but but Lord already already told him. Mm, big mistake. Which he did, but I, I already. Yeah. <laughs> I, did I ask you if you'd already told him? No, I'm telling you to go tell him again. Trying to save lives, trying to be merciful, right? Just in case somebody forgot, I want you to go tell him again. Is this the last warning they're going to get? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I didn't ask you if you'd already told him. I'm, I'm God. I know that you already told him. I want you to tell him again. Don't question me. Just do what I tell you. Right? So he got really mad at Moses. But honestly, I mean, it might have been something I would have... But, but I just did that. <laughs> did, did you forget that? Or did, did you not realize that? Well, God knows everything, right? But So God got really mad at Moses and just go down and do what I told you to do. So Moses, of course, duh. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I'll... So Moses goes down and tells them again. 
don't touch the mountain. Nobody is allowed to touch the mountain. So again, the, the idea for us is that we need to do whatever God says, whether we see the need or not, whether we understand it or not, because we don't always understand everything. But if God says that I need to do something, is that correct? Yep. If God says there's a need to do something, then there is a need to do something, period. There's no need to debate it or discuss it. Just need to do what God tells me to do in His Word and not, well, Lord, I don't know if I'd do it that way. It doesn't matter how I would do it. If God says it's the way it's to be done, that means it's the perfect way to do it. We need to understand that. Okay. We got through it. We're still a little bit behind, but we're, we're a whole lot closer. So. so I gave everybody the 15 through 19 questions.